everybody for joining us with Leo Castaneda today. We are Sense Labs hosting this presentation. So I'm going to do a quick intro with Leo. Leo is a multimedia artist and experimental game designer. He's living in Miami and actually joining us today out of Mallorca in, in Spain. So he's going to take us through his art of fusing gaming, painting, and virtual reality. So I'm going to kick it over to you. Leo, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alexa. Thanks for uh, hosting us at uh, Lightbox and Sense Labs. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, so today I'm going to show uh, the process of creating an exhibition. Uh, that I, I'm, I'm in Europe right now in uh, Majorca because I, uh, a week and a half ago I was part of this exhibit in a place called uh, HEK, House of Electronic Arts in Basel, Switzerland, and um, at HEK, uh, I was able to participate in this show called Radical Gaming, and it's a show of uh, artists that work with uh, uh, video games as a medium or also uh, as part of the concept of their work, and, and I work with both. Um, so uh, in, this, in this exhibition, I was able to do uh, a prototype of this experimental video game that I've been kind of working on uh, indirectly and directly for about 10 years, uh, just called Levels and Bosses, using the, the primary structures of gaming to try to break down the conventions of uh, antagonism, violence, and uh, interaction in what a game could be. And also, uh, uh, this was an opportunity to try out uh, an idea that I've been having for the last few years of having an experimental game, game booth um so so yeah i'm gonna share my screen now to show uh, what some of these experiments were so All right, so this is the, the outcome, and I'm going to share the, the process. So uh, in this uh, exhibition, I basically had a, uh, a trailer to the video game, which uh, I was fortunate enough to have with my cousin in Colombia, Victor Gamboa, and uh, composer Giovanni Caldas helped me out with the soundtrack and uh, sound design and video editing. Um, uh, here I had the, the kind of like game demo, like the actual interactive side of things where uh, I worked with a young programmer named Jaime Soto, also from Colombia, and uh, another young programmer named Gwen Lockman uh, about a year ago. Um, and here we have a painting that I did for a recent exhibition, but it, the painting was also created through the process of coming up with these virtual worlds that you can see in these wallpapers in the background. So kind of getting that like expo booth aesthetic from uh, screenshots of the, of the actual game. Um, and finally you have uh, these uh, like kind of sculptural gaming chairs that um, almost like the culmination of a few years of trying to figure out uh, almost like sculptural merchandising. <laughs> Or what this uh, video game could be, or, or what, yeah, what the hybrid of sculpture, uh, machine, and and uh, something that's you know part of like a promotional booth could be, um, and 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 the the patterns of these chairs come from the worlds of of the game. So uh, I'm going to share then the the process to how I got here. Um, is there some sketches from a few months ago? Trying to figure out, okay, like what's the uh, smallest uh, version of what this exhibit could be? This uh, exhibit could have been in the middle of the floor, could have been in a corner. Like I had to kind of come up with uh, different scenarios of what uh, what it could be. So at, at first, I was thinking, okay, just a really traditional swivel chair, uh, the setup of having a TV uh, with with a controller and just like a, a super simple, um, super simple setup. Uh, 
it's still a bit zoomed in you can see that it's zoomed in um there's an image of <laughs> then a, a chair inside of my art studio that uh i had a fabric with a pattern on it and then i just kind of photoshopped what this uh chair type could be that's without the photoshop then uh this is another uh image of uh, uh, just a drawing made on the computer with um of another uh skin type or or like fabric type for what to cover the chair and then um when i started uh communicating with the, the curator of the exhibition his name is Boris Magdini he's a new media curator based out of Switzerland he um uh, well I had like a very short amount of time to kind of come up with what the prototype would be and like and I had just developed these two virtual worlds for this video game. So the one on the left, you'll see in video towards the end of the presentation, but that's uh, the first level of the video game, this kind of big explosion where uh, it's almost like a sentient world where liquid salts and gases are interchangeable. And then the image on the right, this black and white, like future world where, um, where uh, almost like entities and technology in the world and even like the skins of the player would kind of all be in camouflage so you wouldn't know where one would distinguish the other and and then thinking okay you're going to be there there's going to be some uh, chairs designed after those worlds and maybe two uh, game pads and then uh getting this one painting that i had done and, and turning it into a, a, a carpet um then uh Eventually, uh, I was starting to think, okay, well, maybe these normal swivel chairs are are not enough. Like there could be a more sculptural element. And um, with my partner Lauren, like uh, Lauren Monson, who's a writer and a cultural organizer, who's my girlfriend partner, um, we were talking about creating more of a relationship between the chairs. So I, I started kind of thinking, hmm, have to modify the setup and. Uh, and then um, the chairs, uh, I'm really bad at sewing. So over time, I've learned that, uh, you know, to also work in tandem with, with uh, other people, in this case, my sister, who uh, is, uh, works with fashion. And she helped me kind of rethink what the chair would be, that perhaps doing a a normal swivel chair at first uh, could be too challenging for us. Um, so we, we started looking at these uh, at different chairs online that would be available in Switzerland to do almost like a, a cover, like a slip cover that that would would also be a, a way to do a portable setup. So these are also some sketches done on the computer um, uh, to try to figure out, OK, well, now we have this different like alternate uh, alternately shaped chair like what what are how are the patterns going to work if this is the initial setup or, or or this would be the initial setup um and then and then yeah here are some of the results these are photos from my sister's apartment in new york everything had to kind of be remote um uh, but but yeah basically like uh i designed the, the fabric patterns and then we kind of co-designed like how the fabrics would fit and she executed it like super well. Um, so, so yeah, and then these are then some sketches of okay, now these are this is the modified uh, chair setup. Like, are the chairs gonna respond almost like in a in this uh, you know, like twisting uh, floor setup, or how is it gonna be? Um, I also went into Unreal Engine, which is a program that I used to make the video game work and started doing some layouts. Uh, this is an image of the painting that then I realized I wanted to use. The layouts started consolidating and um, now there are some images of how, yeah, more images of how it looks like now. So these are, these are from my phone just from last week of uh, the exhibit actually coming together and different people seeing it. Here's Lauren, my partner. Uh, here is the the exhibition from a distance. Uh, and you can see the, or not the exhibition, like the, 
to the location. Also, or look, yeah, so, so, the, the museum is over here, and you have uh, the buildings around. And yeah, here are some installation shots. Um, yeah, the, the, I would say the most rewarding aspect of this whole exhibit has been this kind of scaling into a small team. Uh, because as an individual artist, uh, one is used to just doing everything alone. And even the, the team of HEK, like having, being able to, to send someone a high res Photoshop file and then, and then having them uh, like install it where I'm, again, I'm really bad at the physical handling of objects or installing a wallpaper and then suddenly like, boom, like I arrive and it was here, I arrive, boom, the, the, the stretcher for the canvas was ready so I could stretch it. Like everything was, yeah. And anyway, it's just a, a scale that as an individual visual artist, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm not used to as much, but in, in a video game, teams like one is much more used to this uh kind of team aspect so anyways i'm really thankful for those that decided to help me and also um the thanks to some local grants in miami from uh, light arts and lucas projects which are two uh nonprofit arts organizations i was able to to over the last two years kind of fund the the beginnings of this and yeah, some more, more still shots. And, oops, and let's see, I'm getting some chat notifications maybe. Oh, yeah. All right, and here are just some images of two screenshots from the, from the game, and I'll explain more about that soon. Actually, one second. Uh, yeah, and then these are also images of the different uh, areas of the game that I'll get to in a second. And finally, this is an image of what the kind of inspo of the exhibition was going to be this kind of future uh, game booth uh, meets art exhibition hybrid. I'm going to show a little bit more of the game. So, um, again, this is the kind of like the beginning image from the game. You have this large explosion where liquid solids and gases are interchangeable. You'll see us in video soon. Um, I'm working with the Unreal Engine, uh, which I've been working on for like seven years. Um, mostly due to artist-friendly tools, uh, such as uh, visual programming or, or, or material shaders uh, connections that are really easy uh, or, or, or just very accessible from a non-programmer perspective. Um, so, so yeah, and, and I tried to, to do a combination of uh, using pre-existing tools and also adapting uh, like handmade elements. Or, uh, so for example, like some of these rocks over here, I'll, I'll start up in a mud box and I'll use a image of a drawing combined with an, with a photo of a texture of a rock or, or, or even photos from like uh, different landscapes that I'll take and then I'll combine them into, into this image. Um, here we see an image that again, so you so you'll see in video of a kind of like working through what the UI of the video game will, will, will be. We're gonna see this repeated form of this almost like a humanoid character. Um, I started calling it just the other, like the, the term of just like this figure that's, um, that's not you, it's just like this removed figure because uh, when one plays a video game, you always identify as I to this external figure. So it's kind of playing with that. And then, um, and then uh, through the last few years of being able to work with a programmer, uh, I've been able to like flesh out like what the abilities are of this character. Um, for now, 
uh, much of the abilities are tied to these rectangles that are on the head of the character. And the rectangles um, provide different ways of interacting or seeing the world. So from like a light to a laser, then this great one is a, like a scanner. Um, here you can see kind of the process of how over the years uh, I got to, to make the game. Uh, so in 2009, uh, I was just trying to figure out how to lose artist block uh, close to here, actually in Barcelona, I was doing an exchange program while being a student at Cooper Union. Um, and, and I just started adopting the structures of early video games of just being able to do worlds, what they call like worlds without justification, like wor worlds where you just, um, uh, yeah, you have level one, it's this explosion, level two, it's the ocean in Majorca, level three, it's uh, sen the Sense Labs uh, crystal world, you know, you could just have these different uh, environments that you kind of then have to rationalize what's in between them. So I had this painting, then I created this other painting, thinking, okay, well, this painting could be a, a world within this world. And then uh, a friend of mine, uh, Victor Ochoa, who now works with uh, animation and, and uh, he's worked with different comics companies. He, he was starting a, an indie comic book company and he challenged me to turn the first level into, into a story. And then eventually I got to use Unreal Engine, started recreating these spaces as um, virtual worlds. And then also thinking, of how they would be presented either with uh, like experimental game game setups or in, in the case of the sketch down here uh, sculptures that would have vr headsets attached to them um this is another experiment of uh, that, that i did last year also with the programmer and also with my cousin the, the sound designer to like, create almost like a mini game um, to a museum in Cali, Colombia, so La Tertulia, um, that has also helped to kind of figure out the, the interaction types of the, of the game. So you almost pilot a like, little drone to like water, and then, and then you would uh, kind of make these plants grow. Uh, here's uh, that image that I showed earlier of, the, of one of the new virtual spaces, the painting. Actually, these are already images that I've shown. And this one is a, a previous setup with the, the VR headset. And finally, yeah, this is also to show like uh, how it's been this process of like really thinking of what, what the game is going to be and how it's going to be presented. So how you could have furniture that resembles characters from the game and, and uh, and vice versa, almost like a feedback loop where like there's no end or beginning to what what the work can be because every single version of it can can be the reference to something else. Like it could be a future video game level that's based on the HEK ex exhibit or a level that takes place in this kind of futuristic uh, living room where you have like icons from the game like becoming a becoming uh, uh, furniture objects or just like little trinkets on a table. So um, now uh, I'll show, this is like the last trailer, how the game looks like. Um, just to confirm, can, um, I'm sure everyone can hear me, right? All right, um, the audio should work. Yes, we can hear you right now. Yeah. <laughs> right, <thank> you. <laughs> I had to unmute myself. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, for a second I was wondering. Like, hmm, hmm. Yes, we can, we like can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so it's going to be the trailer. Um, I might pause every once in a while just to re explain something, but uh, yeah, here we go.
So you, you might have seen some instances of the character. I, I totally forgot to explain another interaction type, but uh, basically the abilities of the character are based on intensity, and you can intensify any action, and one of the primary actions is just touch. So the character, through, through sketching and just like thinking about like what an interesting ability could be in a game, like I thought of uh, how many times one interacts with violence in a game, in a video game, and then like violence is an accelerated action of, of a, yeah, let's say a bullet is, a, is an accelerated piece of metal, uh, a weapon is usually an acceler accelerated piece of a material, but uh, but one could have the ability to use touch with intensity as like, a, like to strike or to to destabilize or you can also use it's almost like vibrational touch to stabilize areas so you might you might notice that every once in a while there's like this kind of like glowing field of vibration around the hands um, here's also like another ability that um, been experimenting with is this like the ability to change skin. Uh, so anyways, in the current demo it's not fully implemented but soon it will be more implemented like to be able to to have this kind of being that can camouflage with the environment with your the environment responds accordingly. So so anyways you'll you'll, you'll see some uh, instances of well, actually, here is going to be the the same virtual space from the HEK exhibit. Um, uh, so, in theory, one could approach this virtual world with the skin of the world, or without it, and then different interactions or different uh, responses from the environment can happen. And, uh, ended up kind of scrapping that from the main demo because the potential is just like so limited. So, uh, well limitless perhaps but just I, I really want to be super intentional about how it's used just because it can it can have uh, relationships to race to bio biological camouflage to even like the way that you have different abilities in a video game than your game through hey leo violence. can you turn the volume down just a little bit on the video so we can hear you talking oh yes thank you um, yes thank you anyways i was mostly talking about the the kind of skin shifting aspects of that are shown in, in the trailer and how, um, yeah, in, in the current demo, I ended up having to scrap it because the, the the potential is almost like so limitless of what can be explored with the skin of a video game character. Uh, be it like talking about race or talking about uh, an armor, the game that gets abilities to the characters. So anyways, there's, there's a lot there. But, uh, Right now, you can see kind of the the first boss of the game. So, the, here's actually, let me just rewind it a little bit because I was talking too much about the skins where <laughs> this part is probably the, the part that took us the longest to actually have a, a, a competent uh, like antagonist character. So the, the idea here is that this cube controls is like a sentient uh, control over the whole landscape that concern liquid solid or, or gas, so it uh, basically manipulates the environment at will, and the only way to defeat it is to approach it with care because it's absolutely unbeatable otherwise. It's like basically a god. So, anyways, the, the idea is that over the development of this video game, there every every boss character would have almost like a archetypal relationship that could be explored and, and move forward uh, beyond the expectations of what a, a game usually has. So, yeah, so I guess that's, that's it. I don't know how we are on time, but, but um, and I can re return to any screen share situation. Um, are there any questions? Um, 
Hi. Okay. I was trying to find, yes, we did have a few questions. One of them is, is there sound design for the game and how did that come together? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know how audible it was when I was doing the screen share, but um, uh, yes. Yeah, so, well, a few years ago, I was just trying to do everything alone and I would just kind of scrap together sounds <laughs> from sound libraries and stuff like that. Uh, but nowadays, uh, uh, yeah, thanks to the collaboration that I showed briefly with the uh, Museo La Tertulia in, in Colombia, I was able to team up with my cousin uh, and sound designer, Victor Gamboa, that's based in Cali, Colombia. <clears throat> oh my God. Uh, I'm not joking about because I'm going to cry. But I don't know why, but <laughs> some dust. But, um, but anyways, uh, he's an amazing sound designer and uh, basically he comes more from a theater background or or, or doing some sound art for for art purposes but also with theater and in theater you also have the soundtrack uh you also have the potential of doing folly or like different sound situations that are very parallel to video games but are not exactly the same and uh victor also uh, has like an has worked has a uh, work with different bands and he has like this kind of really broad uh musical background and anyways uh i just i just asked him like hey do you want to <laughs> do you want to participate in this together and, and he agreed and then uh, for this trailer and for the the demo he also uh, brought in another friend uh, in colombia who comes from our traditional uh, musical background and uh, some of the experiments that um, they slash we ended up doing um, for some scenes were to use actual uh, traditional like dance music uh, from uh, Colombia like uh, mapale or cumbia and like and mix those with uh, the sounds of the environments which the pr primary environment that's in the video game demo is this first level where like the solids and gases are interchangeable. So we kind of like did this fusion where sometimes you hear these sounds that almost sound like they're rhythmic, but you can almost dance to them. But then there are also sounds of, of like manipulated rivers or or like rocks crashing and kind of having this thing where like the, the melody emerges from sounds of the landscape and, and vice versa. So anyways, that's kind of where we're at. But uh, um, that's only for that level. So. Uh, other levels, I, I think it would be great to even bring in other uh, musicians that have totally different styles to, to kind of work with that, the thematic of, of uh, yeah, but even in the world. Right now, I'm in a, a totally different part of the world. That, that part of the world sounds different, has different music. Why not even work with a collection of musicians and sound designers to create this kind of, uh, like, multi multiverse of sounds uh, but that's the idea in the future as of now it's with my cousin who's been amazing and it's been a really great experience to to work with him um, and yeah that's awesome so one of the other questions that came in is when you're playing the game the player has does the player have to guess how to beat the bosses or are there hints from them to know how to do it um th th there are there are hints uh th that's actually been one of the best learning experiences from this exhibit because again as an individual artist i have less experience with kind of like tech conference where <laughs> tons of people play one game so so my experience has come more from adapting that into art world context so uh this exhibition is kind of like somewhere in the middle let's say two-thirds art world one-third expanded art world uh, but um, anyways uh, I had two options uh, I was going to do a training rooms world that I ended up scrapping or or uh, actually in the game you have like little pop-ups that say like uh, press x to change uh, as now they're called intentions a little rectangle so to change intentions or press a to jump like this the, the traditional uh, aspect where one kind of like moves through the world and then the these little pop-ups show up um, 
Uh, actually, I can see if I can pull up a, some a clip of the game in motion beyond uh, beyond these videos. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I, I do think that it's something that I need a, a lot of work in because uh, let's say in this 15 to 30 minute demo, I introduced a lot of abilities and then I noticed that people uh, were kind of overwhelmed. And, and uh, so, so anyways, it's, it's one of the biggest game design challenges out there is the pacing of, teach, of teaching uh, abilities. Um, but as of now, it's through little pop-ups. But I really need to work on it more so that it's uh, perhaps more intuitive. Like there's uh, actually some uh, YouTube tutorials on on the tutorial. Uh, there's a, a channel called uh, Game Makers Toolkit that did a whole video on that. And for example, the Half Life series or Half Life Two is an amazing example of how to use contextual cues of events that have happened previously in a game world to, to teach abilities or uh, I think I saw another one recent, uh, recently on uh, the Mega Man series or Mega Man X also uh, teaching just through uh, someone coming in and pressing buttons um, but I guess when as the game has developed more it's added more abilities or it's kind of like grown into almost like the the beginnings of something that could be kind of like a episodic uh, action role playing game, or um, and and yeah, and then and some of those games like it's a significant challenge for a video game developer to know like how to teach the sequence of of, of gameplay, especially in a short amount of time. Um, so, so, anyways, uh, it's kind of like a long answer of still figuring it out. I'm gonna see if I can. If I can find really quickly the the video of how it looks like, but uh, yeah. Uh, so as you're finding, yeah, yeah. So another question is, um, what got you interested in video games? Uh, what was okay, your inspiration? What that's sparked a, the start? <laughs> that's a, that's definitely a, a good one slash really easy to answer. So. Um, uh, well, just being a child in the world. <laughs> um, so, um, well, I grew up in Colombia, and I got I was really lucky. I grew up in a family of artists and, and uh, some architects. Um, uh, and and uh, that definitely fueled some of the aesthetic aspirations that I have. But growing up in Colombia, I was also a child of the '90s that. Uh, where Japan and the U.S. and different parts of the world were already <laughs> pushing video games globally. Um, so I kind of grew up kind of doing art and also like playing games as many, many people all over the world do. And, and, and I definitely realized pretty early that, that especially with Legend of Zelda during that time, that uh, video game could definitely be art. So... So that's uh, yeah, that's kind of where 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 it started, and then I, I would draw a lot of characters from the different games, and uh, or also from anime, like Japanese anime, or, or or just like random characters from comics anime. And, and but at the same time, I I I was kind of developing over the years a traditional fine art training. So um, I briefly spoke about it, but. I went to college in Cooper Union, which is a school in New York. Uh, that's mostly a, a fine art school. Uh, I, I mostly went there because I wanted to become more well-rounded. I had also gotten into Art Center College of Design for entertainment design because I really wanted to do drawings for movies and video games. But uh, in the end, I kind of took a left turn into, hmm, maybe I could do that eventually for my own game. I could just do the concept art or, or like the drawings of what the world would be. and and because because uh, of having drawn since I was really little, I have a pretty good ability to draw what is in my head. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, maybe I won't have the number one best skills uh, that I would have gotten through Art Center, but I perhaps could reinforce the conceptual art side that was kind of 
like my not my Achilles heel, but just like the part that I hadn't really developed as much. And uh, as I mentioned, in the kind of grid of multiple images, um, the 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 thought was to kind of undo an artist block because the, the, the Cooper Union. I love Cooper Union; it's an excellent school, but it sometimes could be so tough that it can make one kind of question what one is doing before even trying. And I and I wanted to undo that process by just kind of creating, having the freedom to create anything. And, and, and I thought the world building process of creating a video game was a really good platform to be able to experiment with all kinds of aesthetic styles. And that over time, the aesthetic styles could congeal into um, into something that's more concrete. And and, and and in the end, it was kind of a leap of faith, but it, I think it's, it's worked out. And and then, and it's also kind of thinking of, all right, well, what, what is intuition or what is like inspiration too? And, and then, uh, yeah, it's not just that video games are the, the only inspiration, like they're the structural inspiration, but then there's inspirations from, yeah, from Latin American abstraction, surrealism, sci-fi, biology and all and kind of like recombining all of these uh, through really deliberate choices but also intuitive choices into kind of creating uh yeah something that uh, that ideally would excite me as a eight-year-old <laughs> now and be like oh wow video games are art so that's kind of a, a long answer there <laughs> How long did it take you to work towards um, this level of completion in the game that you're at now? Um, well, I started the series in 2009, so it's already been 12 years. Uh, seven of which, no, or 2013, uh, eight of which, or maybe eight or nine of which I've been using the digital software to try to do it, and three of which I've been iterating and iterating to try to recreate the <laughs> just the first level as a <laughs> as a prototype but hopefully with this uh um just as a like other prototype for prototypes for different vr artworks were the basis to be able to get small grants uh in miami like the idea is to to use this as what uh, yeah i mean all, all video game designers use this like the the vertical slice, the demo, the, the pitch deck, like all, all these kind of scaling situations are things that I've been working towards. And it's been actually really helpful to, to attend uh, some conferences. Uh, so pre-pandemic, I went to the Game Developers Conference three times and just going to see different talks. It was super helpful to, to learn what publishers or what different funders would, would be looking for. And, and I kind of, coincided with the timeline of abilities um, and micro or like you know or micro medium funding of the Miami Arts organizations towards yeah right now finally even though it's taken forever being able to have at least like something not just a, an idea of what the thing could be but uh, an idea plus uh, execution to a certain extent that can be iterated with um, with more feedback, but um, but anyway, so it's, it's, it's taken a long time, uh, but hopefully now uh, it'll be faster because- <laughs> The end uh, is in sight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah, 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 because uh, yeah, uh, like anything, you, you know, you, you need the experience to, to, to know what it's like, uh, and it's definitely really hard to make a video game, but it's easier than before. <laughs> it's, right. Uh, the, the, yeah, the different, tools that we have access to are just so much more present than, than uh, like if I was born 20 years before, I would have had to make my own engine. And the, the barrier, the, the what, what uh, Unreal and different software companies are putting forth to give tools to people is like a multi, multi, multi-million dollar investment that then one doesn't have to take on. So, so anyways, I feel I do feel fortunate about that, and and and, and yeah, then I'm sure there's lots of people that feel fortunate about that. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So another, another question that came in is, so I find it fascinating just the marrying of the, the game design itself. And then also just this idea of exhibiting it as art in an art studio. Um, mm -hmm. So has exhibiting your game in a gallery setting influenced how you develop the game itself? So it's kind of a, what came first, the chicken or the egg <laughs> kind of question. Um, the, yeah, yeah, so the, the overall goal of the game is for it to be both in both industries. So uh, available on Steam uh, and yeah, Epic Games Store, whatever becomes available uh, over time. I know that there's, I mean, I could say PlayStation, Xbox, but I know there's a lot of relationships in between <laughs> that we need to be established, but at least on Steam. Um, and then in terms of the art audience, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely been interesting to figure out, especially uh, like what the different ability levels are of different audience members because if one shows at a gaming conference or only to gamers they're gonna have more dexterity with their hands uh whereas sometimes a someone from an art audience uh, could be a gamer or might not be so anyways that's something that i totally even had to work till the last minute and sending like files at four in the morning the day before the exhibit because I realized that the sensitivity on the joysticks was too too sensitive because I just like fly through the the, the game space and 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 I think uh, you know like when one is working on one thing like one knows it more and, and then I realized that people are making the camera twist in all kinds of directions um, so so yeah um, awesome okay one last question is any advice for new game developers or designers? Um, oh, I finally found the, the, the clip that just on my Google Drive. Oh, okay. But, um, but any advice for for game developers or game developers or designers? Um, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I hope you're looking at internet uh <laughs> sources because uh youtube udemy <laughs> uh skillshare like there's all these uh places that you can really learn from um uh, yeah and and just to yeah I, I feel like a lot of the advice that i've gotten from the internet has has, has proven right and it's not to be followed uh, directly but for example <laughs> you know start start up relatively small <laughs> don't bite off more than you can chew yeah yeah cur yeah currently even hitting the that uh that roadblock of almost too many abilities for a demo <laughs> but uh <laughs> but uh but yeah but um yeah uh, one of the things that again i've learned at gdc and it's available to, as a youtube talk to is is uh is yeah it's like creating this like 15 minute to 30 minute game demo that one like really iterates with and it's something that's at a scale that is possible for for either an individual or a small team uh and then working from there like not trying to do like a 50 hour video game uh -huh. in, in one shot um and what else well another thing that i guess has helped me just is is uh not being afraid of having multiple sources of inspiration or like or, or, or like recombining ideas in a way that perhaps can feel like it doesn't make sense at first, but then um, I think anything in the world can be rationalized and, and for, for good or bad, like to a certain extent, you know, we have political and social situations at the moment that are just like the human mind creating narrative <laughs> out of nothing. But, uh, but at the same time, I feel like that's uh, a lot of a really powerful ability that we have to like get our own experience and recombine it with things that we see in the world and create a mashup that that is unique so uh, so yeah just to perhaps not think that there's like a legitimate best source of inspiration out there in the world but that you as a as a person that is alive at the moment can 
and uh, really look to yourself and to what's genuine to you and to what feels right to you to to find complexity and find ideas. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We uh, this was a fantastic uh, presentation and. We're going to have this available on our YouTube channel so everybody can come and watch it again and again. And thank you very much, Leo. Thank you. And we are going to, yeah, this is great. We're going to end our presentation here. Thank you everybody for sharing.